These are pictures of the Oroville Dam. This is in California in the United States. It's the tallest dam in the United States. And California at the time in the winter, February of 2017, at the time it started raining, it ended a 14 year record breaking drought in California. People were very thankful for the rain. And then it kept raining and it kept raining and it kept raining to the point where the Oroville Reservoir was entirely refilled and they needed to open up the spillway at the top to spill more water out of the reservoir than they could pass through the hydro plant. If they don't spill the water, then there's the danger that the reservoir will overtop the Oroville Dam, which had never happened before. So they opened up the main spillway and began spilling water down this concrete sluice, which is massive. The picture doesn't do it justice. But the concrete broke off. It spalled off the surface. It had been dry for 14 years. And now they begin the water spilling, and the concrete was not able to withstand the force of the water flowing over it. Massive chunks of concrete break off. And I remember being on Twitter in February 2017, seeing the pictures that people, just sightseers, had taken and posted out on Twitter for the Department of Water Resources in California to recognize what was going on with their dam. This was playing out in social media in real time as a potential catastrophe. And remember that if the water levels get too high, that it could overspill the dam. Well, the designers of the dam planned for that. They shut down the main spillway when the spillway was damaged. They allowed the water levels to rise behind the dam. And the way the dam is constructed, this emergency spillway, which is something of a misnomer, allows the water to pass over the top and it's armored with concrete and then it just sort of flows down the barren hillside and it goes down into the Feather River. The trick here is the barren hillside. That is, the hillside is unprotected and it can only take so much water. So the dam operators realized that they had a situation they didn't really know how to deal with. They called the fire department. The Cal Fire Department is populated by people who know how to put out fires but not people who know how to operate dams. They have this adaptive, this resilience mindset, whereas DWR is all wrapped up in risk. The Cal Fire people are much better, they're more responsive in the case of an emergency. And then they called the sheriff. The sheriff is the one who would be in charge of an evacuation, and they had a social problem to deal with. The sheriff is an elected official, and the sheriff had credibility within the community, but DWR does not, because everybody downstream of this community understands that the dam was built to send the water and the power downstate. It goes as far south as San Diego. This is why they built the Oroville Dam, so that they could take water from Northern California and ship it down to the parch portions. They call the sheriff in, they've got Cal Fire in, and there's the Department of Water Resources, and they create a triumvirate. Remember I said about the allocation of decision rights. The decision rights in this crisis have now been reallocated from a single agency, DWR, to these three agencies. The sheriff, who has credibility in the community where DWR does not, and Cal Fire, which has credibility, no expertise, but is good at dealing with the media and organizing the logistics, these kinds of things. And everybody says, we have to shut down the main spillway. We will allow the emergency spillway to operate in the way that it's supposed to operate. The fire chief, Kevin Lawson, he and I have talked about this experience. He set up with his command center. The water level rises, and it begins spilling over the emergency spillway. And everybody's monitoring this. And Lawson's very nervous. And when the geologist from DWR comes up to him and says, Chief, have you got a minute? And Lawson says, well, you know, it's a little busy here, and there's water going everywhere, and we've got, like, lots of emergency helicopters and drones, and I don't know what's going on on Twitter, and i got to deal with the press, but what's on your mind? And she says, I think we have about 45 minutes before collapse of the Oroville Dam. And she says, the water is eroding the barren hillside to the point where it is working, the erosion is working its way back up to the armored concrete structure. At the pace of erosion, I've estimated that we have about 45 minutes before the structure is undermined, the whole thing topples over, and we have release of the entire reservoir. According to the hydrologists, that means about 30 feet of water in Sacramento, California, the capital of California, within 30 hours. Kevin Lawson says, remember, he's the fire chief. He's used to emergencies. He says, is our command center in a safe location? <laughs> and she says, no. Kevin's now got to evacuate all of his command personnel and get them to a safe location at the same time that 
he's worried about collapse of the reservoir and inundation of the state capital. The sheriff is like, evacuate the entire community. Largest evacuation in the state of California history. We're talking almost 200,000 people. And it goes out on Twitter. This is not a drill. Imminent collapse of the Oroville Dam. You can imagine the, the reaction in the community. But I tell you what we do. Let's fire up those generators and let's open that broken main spillway back up. And they cranked it open faster than it had ever been opened before. Sure enough, the water is directed out the main spillway so that it no longer is overtopping the emergency spillway and the disaster becomes, instead of a massive catastrophe, it's just a very expensive like dam reconstruction operation. This is what happened. That's the sort of the short news narrative. This is one way of thinking about what's going on. The individual has a set of beliefs. Those beliefs are always wrong. I mean, they might be useful, but the way people construct their understanding of the world is an oversimplified representation. So they have beliefs. One of the beliefs was that the emergency spillway was designed to handle all this flow. That's what they were taught. That's what the design said. That's what the language said. That's what the operating procedure said. So they said, all right, we'll use the emergency spillway because we believe that's what we're supposed to do. They take action to activate the emergency spillway, but unfortunately, they are surprised. Surprise is when your perception of events contradicts your beliefs. And when you're confronted with surprise, there's no more operating manual. There's no algorithm. There's no formula for how to respond. Instead, you must be innovative, perhaps creative, and do something outside the algorithm. So the belief system and the meaning making that happens within the organization and the individual <laughs> is important because initiative here is a creative act. And it's the creative act that saved the dam. I mentioned that the evacuation orders went out on Twitter, that the whole thing played out on social media. And sure enough, you know, here's the uh, California Department of Water Resources. They're on social media, and they're saying emergency evacuating, uh, evacuation order issued. Officials are anticipating a failure of the auxiliary spillway at Oroville Dam within the next 60 minutes. But nobody, because this has happened once before, the Department of Water Resources order in an evacuation, but nobody really knows whether to believe the DWR. The sheriff ordered the evacuation, and they do believe the sheriff. So people are getting out of town. Residents of Oroville should evacuate in a northward direction. Other cities should follow the orders of their local law enforcement. Whatever that means, you've got 60 minutes to figure it out. Resilience is not in the concrete or the drainage structures or whatever you think the technological system is. Resilience is in your capacity to adapt, your capacity to sense, your capacity to anticipate, and then your capacity to learn from these surprises. And I think it's really interesting that you use the word, we're anticipating a failure. They did not say what the probability of failure was. It wasn't like, you know, 25% chance of showers today. They didn't, they don't, that's not anticipation. A probabilistic forecast is risk-based. Anticipation is possibility-based. They're thinking that it could fail, and they have no idea what the probability is. This came through via text message, and I think it's really interesting. It's a screenshot of the evacuation order, and this person is on 3% battery at the time that this order <laughs> comes in. Immediate evacuation from the low levels of Oroville and areas downstream is ordered. Has this situation developing within the Oroville Dam Auxiliary Spillway. Uh, operation of the auxiliary spillway led to severe erosion. Failure of the spillway structure will result in uncontrolled release of floodwaters from Lake Oroville. The response on Twitter was really interesting. Now, there's a lot of people going back and forth and going, holy crap, you know, let's get out of town. I'm watching this happen on Twitter from the comfort of Tempe, Arizona, with no water anywhere. But it didn't take long for the Twitter bots, for the fake accounts on Twitter to attempt to politicize the crisis at the Oroville Dam. Now, these accounts have all been deleted. I can't get you screenshots of these accounts, but I have a colleague who downloaded all the data, saved the tweets. He says, one of the most influential Twitter accounts during this crisis was RT.com. Does anybody know what RT stands for? That's Russia Today. They're the according to him, the third most influential, that is contacted, retweeted, liked, impressions, third most influential account on the Oroville Dam crisis? How does that make sense? Well, they got drone footage and they put the drones up and you know, watching the spillway and the reservoir. Actually, the drones were a huge problem for Cal Fire. They're like, 
what the hell are we, can't we just clear the airspace? And the drones are going all over the way and they're getting fantastic footage. It's extremely dramatic. It's very sort of attractive and charismatic on Twitter. And they're using the drone footage to attach their messages. Now, I did not copy the Russia Today messages I, because uh, my colleague, Michael Simeone at Arizona State University, gave me these ones instead, which he said are even juicier. He says, these are a few of the zingers from the now deleted account. Uh, at Americanus Lupus says, California spends billions on illegal immigrants, but nothing on the Oroville Dam. Now, how the hell Oroville got to be an illegal immigrant issue is beyond me. But you scroll down, and this is a persistent, systematic misinformation campaign designed to create political divisions with the community. Breaking the Oroville Dam evacuees find that the emergency shelters are full of illegal Mexican <laughs> immigrants claiming sanctuary rights. The outrage. It's not just that they're saying the reason Oroville is collapsing is because we spent all our money on welfare benefits for illegal immigrants. We didn't spend any on infrastructure. Of course that's false. They're saying that the emergency shelters, that our response has been captured, that the, there are insufficient resources for the response, because why? Because of all the illegal Mexican immigrants. It doesn't have to be true to spark this emotional response. Anyone who wants to believe this kind of thing and use this misinformation can to make their political statement can grab hold of it and turn it into their own meaning. What does it mean that the Oroville Dam is on the verge of collapse? It either means some incompetent engineers at the DWR failed to maintain their concrete and update their cracks and do their drainage tiles the way they're supposed to. That could be one meaning. Another meaning is we've neglected investment in our infrastructure and we've taken it for granted during the 14 year period of a drought. Nobody thought a flood was possible. And so we divested. it. Could be another meaning. A third meaning could be these things are inevitable. There is no infrastructure that we can afford which would encompass all the possibilities that nature will throw at us. We must stay adapted and the resourcefulness of the individuals there managing the crisis is extraordinary and has saved us all from, dis it could be a third meaning. And all of these meanings are being socially constructed in real time in social media. We do not need a denial of service attack. We don't need your WannaCry virus. We don't need your not PETA or whatever it is. We want all your servers and all your fiber optic cables operating exactly as you designed them so that we can exploit them with this kind of misinformation. That's a cyber attack. Okay, so summing up. These are the command and control dimensions that we get from military doctrines, the decision rights. We may be either centralized or distributed. And resilience is neither in the centralization nor in the distribution of decision rights. It's in the capacity to switch back and forth as necessary. Access to information. Information could be closed or it could be open. And resilience is neither in closed information systems or in open information systems. It's in the capacity to switch back and forth in response to the stress or the threat. There are the patterns of interaction. One way to think about patterns of interaction is to use the metaphor of the tree. All the communication must go up and down the limbs. Another pattern of interaction is the web where everybody can be connected to everyone else. Whereas the classic way of organizing knowledge and disciplines in the Industrial Revolution was predicated on the tree, the information revolution, our cyber systems, are predicated more on the web. And resilience is neither in either one, it is in the capacity to switch. The dimension that we need to understand better is how do people, both at the individual and the organizational scale, make meaning of the experience, whether those are threats or responses, how do we decide what those things mean? It's a question of leadership. Meaning is a socially constructed process that can be either be led by the leaders or if the leaders neglect, people will make their own meaning. Our need for meaning is so strong that as soon as the president of the company or whomever it is, is done with the speech, one person will turn to the next and they'll say, what do you think he meant? Well, I think what he means, and they will begin to construct a meaning, whether it was the leader's intended meaning or not.